guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here, John Schnepp. Hey, what's going on? Finally watched The Walking Dead. Not going to do any spoilers, but whatever. <laughs> we got it so spoiled for also you yesterday. Also here, Christian Harloff. Hey, it stinks out there. You hear me? It stinks. What does that mean? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since it was announced that Disney had bought Lucasfilm and were delivering more Star Wars movies, many fans have wondered when we may get another Indiana Jones adventure. Steven Spielberg himself suggested at a recent press event that he is most likely directing a new Indiana Jones. In that same vein, many have speculated who that new Indiana Jones may be, but according to recent comments by Indiana Jones producer Frank Marshall, in an interview with Total Film, they're not interested in anyone else other than Harrison Ford, playing the role. Marshall said the following, There are a lot of rumors. We haven't even sat down to talk about Indy yet. At some point, we'll sit down. But there's a bunch of people who could probably take the baton. We're not doing the Bond thing where we're going to call somebody else Indiana Jones. We have to figure this out. John, how do you interpret Frank Marshall's comments? Well, it sounds like what I was hoping for ain't going to happen. Um, I, you know, I've wanted them to you know, go back to the, the golden age of Indiana Jones, get a younger actor, have it set during World War II, you know, Indy versus Hitler sort of thing. I was really hoping for that. Um, but it sounds to me, my interpretation of it is pretty straightforward. Frank Marshall, if Frank Marshall says it, 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 this isn't like some actor on the movie who says, this is Frank Marshall. And him or Steven Spielberg, if he says, now nah, we're not looking at anybody else for the role, that tells me, we're going to get an Indiana Jones movie, and it's going to be Harrison Ford, period. All I, I think at this point, we can probably end our speculation <clears throat> about will Chris Pratt do it? Will Bradley Cooper do it? Will Pauly Shore do it? Will Hayden Christensen do it? Will who? You know, it, it doesn't matter. Maybe Michael B. Jordan at this point, since he's playing everything else. Um, I guess we can stop with it, because they're going to do another Indiana Jones movie, and it's going to be Harrison Ford. Now, he still says something in there about passing the baton. But it's not going to be to a new Indiana Jones. It sounds like Indiana Jones is going to, like, old man Jones is going to hand over the fedora and the whip to a new hero whose name is not Indiana Jones. So that's what it sounds like to me. I'm a little bit unclear about that. But my interpretation is this as much is clear. We're not going to see another actor play Indiana Jones probably until that horrible, hopefully long time from now day when Harrison Ford is no longer with us. And... Maybe they're going to get a new actor to play a new character to carry on the adventures that's not named Indiana Jones. I know, Schnepp, you heard these comments from Marshall. How do you interpret them? I interpret, I interpret them as saying that, yeah, Harrison Ford is definitely going to play Indiana Jones. I don't think Mutt is going to be back, uh, the Shia LaBeouf a character. But <laughs> Just I, do it! I do think that uh, they're going to, they are going to pass the baton to, like, I don't know if it's going to be him, because him and Marion, you know, obviously were married in the the fourth Crystal Skull movie. I don't know if they they end up having a kid or maybe they, they adopt kids. They went to the kids. alien world for their honeymoon. They did go to the alien world. We, I don't even want to refer to the fourth movie. Hopefully, we just not never refer to it. <laughs> but uh, I think they are going to like create a new, a new kind of Indian. Like maybe it'd be a female Carolina Jones Somebody or something. Somebody in the chat board is calling it just the new character Alabama Bob. I thought, <laughs> I, I, yeah, any any new character I think would be fun to see introduced in the fifth Indiana Jones film, so that. The baton can then be passed over. I don't know if they're going to do like a 60s or 70s set Indiana Jones, but, you know, I think it would be a smart idea if they are going to do, you know, keep Harrison as Indiana to to make that new character in this new movie. Christian, what do you think? Still pitching my idea before Len Weissman tried to rip it off. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, you know, you have it. It's possible that, like, you're still going to have Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones. From Marshall's comments, it seems absolutely what the case is. And that you have these list of actors that maybe, let's, using Chris Pratt, if, if Chris Pratt is the guy and they decide to do it, if they want to throw back, because I think it would be a disservice to Indiana Jones if you don't ever see him back in that golden age in the, you know, the, the 40s and the late 30s, early 40s, that's where he really thrived, and that was him in his prime. They really have to set up this new character that his protege or whoever it is to where we're going to want to see this person in the, you know, 60s, 
70s you know i don't know I, I i would rather it be something i still think there's hope that we have chris pratt or whoever it is in a flashback scene the way that they were talk the way that they're going to hopefully not do die hard and do it in indiana jones <laughs> indiana jones year one yeah <laughs> all right what's next as many of you know a sequel to the keanu reeves action film john wick is in development and begins shooting this week now we know who wick will be fighting according to a report in the hollywood reporter actor musician Con Common will play the main antagonist, the head of security for a female crime lord. Christian, do you like the choice of Common as the bad guy for John Wick 2? It's funny, when I was reading this story this morning, I, I I said, he wait, he's coming back? And then I'm like, wait, no, that was Run All Night. He was in Run All Night, and he was menacing in that movie. The movie yeah. wasn't, it was okay, but he was menacing. So I absolutely like the addition of him. I think that if you've seen Run All Night, and he's been in a ton of other stuff too, but Run All Night was the one that I flashed back to immediately because he, he went toe to toe with Liam Neeson, and I bought it. Uh, and I think, and he was even a little bit more menacing than yeah. Liam Neeson could be. And I <laughs> think that to see him pair up with Keanu Reeves in this one, it's John Wick too. So whoever they're going to put in there as the villain, I think that they know what they're doing, and I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah, I, I I also liked him in Run All Night, but when I think about him being in uh, John Wick 2, what my head instantly goes to is actually wanted. I thought he was oh, right. really good. He plays that strong. He is a threatening presence when he's on screen. And he's really good at it. Even in that little comedy date night with Steve Carell and Tina oh, Fey, yeah, yeah. when he was one of the monsters, he has he's just got a way of a charisma, a quiet charisma about himself that just by his presence on screen, he can emote a threatening presence. And I think something like that and a John Wick too. Now, I don't want a guy that can one-on-one -on -one go toe-to-toe -to -toe with John Wick. That's just not supposed to be possible. But a guy who can try to think two steps ahead of him with muscle with him and all that kind of stuff, I actually think this is a really nice choice. But why why, why can't he go toe-to-toe -to -toe if it's a sequel? You know, a guy, a guy who is act equally as good as he is. Maybe. I guess it's because, like, Wick, the mythology they set up around Wick in that first one is he is the boogeyman. Like, yeah. he lived, they sent him after entire mobs himself. Like, so that sort of thing. Like, that doesn't mean he's not vulnerable. Clearly, as we saw in the first film, he can be stopped with enough guys and enough thinking. And I hope um, Common isn't just brute muscle. I hope he's an intellectual. I hope he's a thinking man's villain. I hope he thinks two steps ahead of John Wick and that becomes the bigger threat to him. You know, either way, I really do like this choice, which is kind of funny because if you ask me to give you a potential list of names that I would like to see as the bad guy, I probably wouldn't have thought of Common off the top of my head. Right. But then when I heard it, I'm like, yeah, I'm on. I'm on board for this. What uh, do you think? I'm still waiting for him to be Green Lantern. Because I remember, I was like, <laughs> whenever I hear Common is is cast anything, I was like, oh yeah, he was going to be uh, Green Lantern. In George Miller's uh, yeah, George, George Miller's, Miller's Justice League. League. Yeah. So you know, I always keep thinking is maybe when Green Lantern finally pops around, he's going to be in <laughs> Green Lantern. But uh, I think he's he's a good he's he was great in Run All Night. He's creepy, and uh, I think he could play a, another John Wick. Like he's the guy who's the original boogeyman that they take out of retirement to take the new boogeyman who's John Wick who came out of retirement. Right. Like he could be a retired dude who's like, oh yeah, and, and the, Ke the Keanu uh, John Wick character could be like, they got him to try to take me out? Like he should be afraid of this guy. You know, that could be kind of fun. Like, a, like it's John Wick fighting himself. It could be if he's another version of yeah. him, just from another mob. All right, folks, we've reached out part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ashley's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? According to a report in Variety, the upcoming giant monster movie, Colossal, has rounded out its cast. Academy Award winner Anne Hathaway and Jason Sudeikis will be joined by Downton Abbey's and the upcoming Beauty and the Beast, Dan Stevens. Colossal follows Hathaway as Gloria, a woman living in New York, who, after breaking up with her boyfriend, Stevens, moves back home. It's there that she finds out that she has some kind of psychic link to a gigantic monster that is terrorizing Soul. In order to prevent further destruction, Gloria needs to determine why her seemingly insignificant existence has such a colossal effect on the fate of the world. Schnett, buy or sell the sounds of colossal. I buy it mainly for the reason it reminds me of this old science fiction film called Forbidden Planet, where it's like 
it, it, if that's the you know the the hook is like she actually created this giant monster out of her hatred and vengeance or like fe feelings of sorrow from this horrible breakup that it's like this psychic resonance that somehow this creature is like she's controlling it because she created it I have no idea if that's the if what's gonna happen but that's what I like about it Christian uh, I buy it I'm, I'm confused though I don't know if it and and this is only because Sudeikis <laughs> is in it I go is it a comedy and that's not necessarily fair because he could do dramatic stuff or action you and i were talking about this off camera that this could very well be like a uh, an action comedy like a, like a 90s uh michael bay movie or something along those lines i think what they're doing here is capitalizing off of all the hype already between godzilla and god's mm. and and pacific rim and all these right. it's another monster movie it could be a lot of fun and you have anne hathaway in there who's a very capable actress and with sudeikis and uh, adding dan stevens though is the question on the table here i think this guy elevates a lot. He's a, he's a new up and coming star. I think that's the reason he was cast Beast. I finally saw the guest, um, and uh, he was amazing in that film. I think yeah, this he, he yeah. tore the house. He's down. creepy. He's he he really yeah. creepy. He's going to be a major star, and it, this doesn't seem like a star role, but it's another one that you. It just keeps upping his uh, your your awareness of him. Right. And it's funny with with Dan too. It's like he left Downton Abbey because. I mean, that show is just such a global phenomenon, and he thought he was. And and normally when that happens, you see. If they're going to catch on, they catch on a little bit faster. But it, it was a long time between when he left Downton and when, say, he got announced as Beast in Beauty and the Beast. That could be a role that really... I mean, if that movie is as good as we're all hoping it's going to be, that could put him on the next level. So, yeah, by the way, I love the uh, Attack on Titan image there that Ray yeah, put, cool. put in the picture. That's pretty yeah. cool. I buy this. I, I think this sounds really cool. I love the scenario you were painting yeah, about that, that this creature is actually just a physical manifestation of her own inner psyche and what's going on there. Or maybe it'll be something com right. completely different. You're right. The addition of Jason Sudeikis in this cast list, like if you just hear the story premise, you know, monsters, a psychic connection to this girl. It's got Anne Hathaway. It's got Dan Stevens. And it's got Jason Sudeikis. That guy kind of changes your whole perception of what this movie might be. Will it be, I, I didn't, like you were saying, will it be like an action comedy in vein of like The Rock and uh, oh what was the name of the Earthquake movie he was just in, San Andreas? San Andreas. Oh, San Andreas. So like right. that where it's a little serious with you know, kind of campy at the same time. Who knows, I'm gonna be fascinated to hear, but until we know more, for me, it's a buy. All right, what's next? The Hollywood Foreign Press and NBC have announced that comedian Ricky Gervais will return this year to host the 73rd Golden Globe Awards. Gervais has hosted the event three times before from 2010 to 2012 with a little controversy and a lot of success. Gervais takes over the hosting duties from Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, <clears throat> who have led the show for the last three years. John Byersell, Ricky Gervais hosting the upcoming Golden Globe Awards. I'm going to buy it, actually. Like, the Golden Globes for me is it's a totally I mean a Golden Globe award to me is about as useful and as about as valuable as this water bottle mm -hmm. I mean it's it's a totally insignificant award that people give artificial value to at least the Academy Awards it's six thousand members of the movie industry voting on their peers with six thousand voting base can it's very difficult to influence or sway Hollywood Foreign Press, I qualified for the Hollywood Foreign Press. All you gotta be, it's only about 60 members, 60 to 80 members. All you gotta be is somebody who writes for something that isn't in the United States, but you live in the United States. You're a part of the Hollywood Foreign Press, congratulations. But they put on the best show. I, I don't think there's any debate that as far as the quality of the show goes, they put on a much better show than the Academy Awards, and that's a shame, but they do. Uh, I think Ricky Gervais did a really good job. And remember, for a long time before Gervais started hosting it, the, the Golden Globes never had a host, per se. They had the ceremony, but never really a host. He came in, he set the tone, he really rocked the boat, and I think even he's admitted today that in those early days of him hosting the Golden Globes, sometimes he went too far. Like, sometimes it went from, you know, Billy Crystal is a master at the Academy Awards of poking fun at people, but making everybody laugh. Sometimes Gervais in those first few Golden Globes, it crossed the line into meanness and it made just people uncomfortable. It was a roast. Yeah, it was really yeah. more of a roast, but even, I'm very mean-spirited yeah. roast sometimes while also being hilarious at the same time. And I've heard him in interviews say, yeah, he's learned his lesson from that. And also now, I think there's a really neat challenge for him because Tina Fey and Amy Poehler have crushed it the last three years. So I think that's gonna be a really good challenge for Ricky Gervais. I think he's gonna up his game. I think he's gonna make this really entertaining. So even though I don't give a crap about the Golden Globes, I'm gonna watch the show and Ricky Gervais hosting it is gonna make it that much better, I think. So for me, it's a buy. 
It's a buy for me as well. But here's the thing: no one who watches this show, or or especially who hired him, or anyone in the audience, is allowed to complain if he goes over the line because they they <laughs> you have knew to, what you're getting you into. Knew what you're getting right. into, and the first time, and then the second time he comes back, and the, and he does it again, and people are complaining. But now he's had time off, and you're bringing him back again. So you cannot complain. If it, it, like, and, and, and you also know if you're a viewer what he's done before and you're tuning in because you're possibly what's he going to do what's he going to say I don't think he's going to get better I think he's going to do exactly the same thing that he's done in the past because that's who Ricky Gervais is he doesn't apologize to anyone he does what he wants to do and that's why you either love him or hate him I happen to love him I think that he, and, and even though I was there were sometimes I did think he went too far and I was like eh, I don't know if that's the case but then I go well they brought him back and now they're bringing him back again. And I am looking for it. I am going to tune in to go, well, who is he going to destroy now? Because that's what's going to happen. But one of the big differences, I, I heard an interview with Steve Carell recently. Because, um, you know, <laughs> Gervais would go after Carell sometimes because he was leaving the office yeah, and all right. that kind of stuff. But what Carell was saying, I think it might have been with Piers Morgan, I'm not sure. But Carell's basically saying, he goes, you know, in, in former days, in the past, he would just go at you and he would go at you. He goes, but it's different now. He goes, at a recent event, like he grabbed me backstage first. He goes, hey, I'm going to do this little gag about this. Is cool? You cool? And, and that's a difference. That's a shift right. in Gervais now. And I think we're going to see it. I think he's going to, honestly, I think he's going to reel it in just a little bit. And I think it's going to result in him being even funnier. I really, I really, we'll I don't know, Schnapp, what do you think? I love Ricky Gervais. I love that, you know, how, how, like you nailed it. It's a roast. And he's not afraid to like put anybody on the spot. And that's what we all love about him. He's going to call people out. He's like, like Dan Klaus in the comic book world. That's Ricky Gervais in the television and movie world. He's going to put people on the spot, laser vision them, crisp them, then move on to the next person. You know, it's like, uh, that he's coming back. You're right. They're saying, look, can you reel it in a little bit? And he's like, sure. Eh, he's not going to reel no, it in. You're right. But <laughs> I like that you said he, he might give people a little heads up. Hey, I'm going to say this little thing. Just so you know, is that cool? And people are going to be like, go for it. It's all for yeah. fun. I mean, that's what made the Golden Globes even watchable. I mean, for myself, when Ricky, Ricky Gervais came on, it was that actually made it entertaining. I didn't really care who was going to win or lose. I just wanted to watch a fun event. And he makes it fun. You could also remember that with the case of Steve Carell, who we've had a relationship with before, he can go and say, hey, I'm going to do this bit. He's not going to be able to flag down everybody in the no. Oh, no. And so, and there are going to be people that can't take jokes, um, yeah. and he's going to do it anyway. Sometimes, as I'll tell you, for a comedian, it's fun to go after the people who can't take jokes, right? Because everyone should that. be able to laugh at themselves, and if you can't, if they can't, it's then that's even, even more, more fun. Yeah, to but, on but I think we all agree, though. I mean, there were I, there were a couple of moments in those first, especially the first two years, and the third, I thought he was much better when it crossed a line from 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 poking fun or whatever right. to some minutes. And here's the other thing too. He's now coming on the heels of Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, who had the highest ratings the Golden Globes have ever had. Everybody celebrated. And, and they, beloved. And, and beloved. beloved. Yeah. And they poked fun at a lot of right. people, but they did it in such a way that it came across like a Comedy Central roast right. where it was all in fun and everybody felt that. And I think Gervais over the years, I think he's probably mastered that. I, I honestly think we are in for a really good time. He's going to go at some people, but I think it's going to have a little bit more of a spirit of fun to it instead of, no, you, you really... Suck. But that's, yeah, that's, that's but that's also who he is. The difference between like that's Tina, true. Tina yeah. Fey and Amy Poehler are those kind of likable fun. They'll, they'll break your balls and you'll yeah. so you'll crack up about it. Right. As where Gervais, he'll break your balls. You'll go oh, and yeah. everyone else will crack up yeah. about it. Like, he's like he's the acid tongue guy who's going to put the he, spotlight. He is. On you, you know? And he, what was the last award? She just did something recently to where he, and I can't remember which one it was. Where he's like, I'm not. I think it was just a this. presenter. I don't think he was right. Whatever yeah. award show it was, and he's like, I'm not going to win this. And he just whole and he made fun of himself this time. He's. I agree with you. The first time that he was on the Golden Globes, I didn't think he was the right. I laughed. I didn't think he was the right choice because I, he did cross the line many times. And I was just like, that's not the right choice. Maybe they're not going to bring him back. And then they brought him back. I'm just like, all right, do what you you know, do. you know what the difference is? Like where Billy Crystal, Tina Fey, and Amy Poehler have done, and what I think Gervais is going to be able to do, is when, when they go out and poke fun at people, when we can all laugh and feel good. When it doesn't work is when they go at people and it even makes us as the audience, instead of feeling, ha, 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 us feeling the audience saying, oh, geez, I right, feel bad for that guy. When it makes the audience <laughs> right. feel uncomfortable, that's, and I, and honestly, I've seen Gervais do more pre like presentations at different award shows, stuff like that, and I honestly feel like he's mastered that now. I yeah. think he's, he's learned how to go at people, but in such a way that makes everybody laugh and everybody feel good. And I think he's, I honestly think he's just gonna crush it. I really do. Yeah.
I want a couple groaners in there, though. Oh, otherwise, he, not, he will. otherwise, it's not great. Don't worry raise. about it. They'll yeah. be there. I'm looking forward <laughs> to them. Um, yeah. All right, folks, listen. It is Tuesday, which means it's time for us to talk about what is opening this week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Now, we got three films going into wide release. Today, we're going to talk about two of those films. We'll talk about the other one on Thursday. So, Ashley, what is opening up this week? First up is the new Bradley Cooper, Sienna Miller film, Burnt. Adam Jones, played by Cooper, was once a top chef in Paris until drugs and alcohol led to a meltdown that put his career on hold. After moving from New Orleans to London, Adam gets a shot at redemption when his former mater D, played by Daniel Bruhl, reluctantly hires him as the head chef of his fine dining restaurant. Demanding perfection from his newly formed staff, the acerbic and temperamental Jones gets a second chance to fulfill his dream of earning a third Michelin star. Next is the political comedy Our Brand is Crisis. Feeling badly in the polls, a Bolivian presidential candidate enlists the services of an American management team for help. The main star is Calamity Jane Bodine, played by Sandra Bullock, a brilliant strategist who comes out of self-imposed retirement for a chance to beat her professional nemesis, the loathsome Pat Candy, played by Billy Bob Thornton. With Candy working for the opposition, it becomes a down-and-dirty, all-out battle between political consultants where nothing is sacred and winning is all that matters. Christian, which of these films should audiences be looking forward to the most? Um, you know, it's funny. I, I was talking about this with Schnepp before. As far as our brand is Crisis, it does seem like a kind of a dated film. I haven't seen it. I see it tonight. Um, but it almost kind of reminds me of Wag the Dog yeah. uh, when those types of movies. Oh, we were talking about like, some, some Travolta color. movie yeah, from the 90s. Yeah, Primary Colors yeah. or something along those lines. And then even even the, the name, Pat Candy. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, I don't know. I like Sandra Bullock. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what the movie's about. I don't know how well it's going to do. And there was a question that was posed on Movie Talk last week about what movies you like that other people's other people do not. It looks like, as far as critic ratings go, Burnt is that for me. I really, really enjoyed it. But it's, a lot of people were seeing it don't like. I don't know if they thought it was cliched or whatever it was. I really thought it was a a great not a great movie but a really good movie i thought it was a good performance by cooper i thought the chemistry between cooper and miller was actually better than it was in american sniper and they didn't have to worry I like about their a baby chemistry more than his with jennifer lawrence to be honest yeah, I, they, I really do they have great chemistry in this movie um and i also daniel Bruhl's is always amazing in the film too and there was just something the way that the food is set up the way, every everything the way that it's portrayed and i said it in my review is that it, it was a sexy film like the way that the, it was that john wells of er fame directed this movie as well and there was just something about it i enjoyed it so i would take burnt out of the two i'm actually looking forward to all three movies opening this weekend but the one that has stood out to me the most is our brand is crisis I thought the trailer, for just for me personally, the trailer hit every note right to me. It has all the good feelings about like a 90s political expose kind of movie with the modern comedy kind of sensibilities too well. I love Billy Bob Thornton in these kinds of roles. I really yeah. do. And I, I just think the, ca the, 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 the rounding out of the cast is all great. I can't remember the name of the actor, but the guy playing uh, her client, the Bolivian presidential oh, candidate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in that one uh, Jack Ryan movie where he was like the uh, cartel enforcer yeah, he's been guy. For a while. He is. I love seeing him whenever he pop. I can't even remember his name, but I love it when I see him pop up and things. So looking forward to all three of these films very, very much. But the one I'm looking forward to most is probably Our Band is Crisis. Yeah, I mean, you know, just from the trailers, I mean, Burnt, it felt a little mechanical to me. Like, oh, it's this chef and he's going to fall in love with that young girl and he's going to get his and he's going to get that star at the end. It just it didn't really it didn't really hook me and it's definitely like you know we were talking about it I was like is it like chef and you're like no it's more like an Anthony Bourdain kind of like you know he you know had a really rough life yeah, and he's yeah. trying to get his get his act back together so you know Bradley Cooper's a great actor I kind of want to see it our brand is crisis really I don't want to see it all I found I thought the trailers just did remind me of like a bad late 80s early 90s like you know kind of corny uh, even at the very end like where me and Holly were groaning when they showed that llama from the trailer oh, yeah, get hit yeah. I was like what is this the hangover <laughs> I loved it I got but it, it I love I know moment. but it just to me it was corny and it was like oh you're pulling that card in the trailer I don't know it doesn't it feels like it doesn't know what it wants to be like is it going to be an over-the-top comedy or is it going to be an actual situation comedy or is like is it going to be funny at all I wonder I mean so uh, of all the three of them the one we're not talking about is the one I actually do want to see the most so 
which we'll, we'll talk that about one yeah. on Thursday. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'm just curious. Out of the three movies we got coming out, well, let's focus just on the two on Burnt and Our Brand right. is Christ. We'll talk about Scarlet's Guide a little bit later in the week. But which one are you? more likely to run out and see uh, it's uh, both of them really aren't jumping out at me but if i had to absolutely pick i'd probably pick burn even though the story kind of does seem like it's been done a few times i just i love bradley cooper so i would probably go see that one if i had to pick out of the two there's a lot to love yeah. all right folks we've reached out part of the show now for mailbag listen if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show just email it to us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com i'm gonna let you know too we do this show live Live now. So if you are one of the thousands of people watching the show live right now, you can also tweet in some questions and we're going to take some of your live Twitter questions at the end of the show. So just tweet your questions in. You see the Twitter handle right there. Tweet questions to at Collider Video. By the way, make sure you're following us on Twitter as well. But tweet to us at Collider Video and Ashley will pick out some questions at the end. But for now, let's get to the mailbag questions. So Ashley, what do we got? Justin Parker writes, hey guys, I've been watching for a little over two and a half years and Thank have you. been a devotee since the days in that little closet space. My question <laughs> is with Will Smith taking on Deadshot, a possible multi-appearance contract and then gearing up to do the announced Bad Boys 3 and 4, will Mr. Smith ever return to what I consider consider a film that had serious potential, Hancock, or even headline a new franchise that doesn't have a pre-existing brand or fan base like the juggernaut that will be Suicide Squad. Keep up the great work. Yeah, I'm going to tell you right now, I am one of these, I, I really enjoy Hancock. I thought it fell apart. I thought it completely fell apart in the last act. But it, to me, Hancock is a film that's like Underworld. And I've talked about Underworld every once in a while, where it was a movie where by the end of it, I wasn't thrilled with the movie, but there was so much good mythology there that I thought you could make something fantastic out of it. And there were elements in the original that were really good. The first two acts of Hancock, I just loved. And like I said, it lost its way, kind of fell apart in the third act. But I still think you set up something really special that you could do a sequel. For, so for me personally, I would love to see another Hancock and see him go back to that franchise. That's just me. I'm pretty sure you can probably get Jason Bateman back too. Anyway, Christian, what about you? Um, I, I agree with you that I actually really liked the first half of Hancock, and then I just, I remember being in the theater going, "What happened? This is yeah. a mess." And then at the by the end of it, with the reveal, I'm like, "Ah, who cares?" And I think that that's kind of where we've been with Hancock is who cares because it didn't even do that well and it's mm. it's a movie that it's been too long and it was before the MCU hit and it was all it was right around that time or whatever it right. came out um, and it's been forgotten and it's hard it's it's it gonna be it would be very tough to do a sequel for me people go oh yeah that was a that, that's a movie that deserves a sequel it's a, it's a big risk for the studio to make that sequel unless they do it you know unless Will Smith kind of put some money up behind it on his own Schnapp, what do you yeah think? I don't see Hancock returns ever happening i mean i, I agree with you yeah, i don't think it'll happen either yeah the, <laughs> the first half of it was really enjoyable and i agree with what you guys are both saying that it falls apart like midway through and then it really gets really confusing at the end you're like greek gods and all this other you know i would say see it though if you've never seen hancock yeah. it's worth seeing it's really fun to see will smith do his turn as a superhero but he's already been in all these giant movies i don't mind him doing these franchise films and then he does a concussion or he does he does a whole bunch of movies yeah Every year he's in a different movie that's not a franchise, that's not a sequel. Just keep your eyes and ears open and you'll see it. It's happening like this December. He's in Concussion and then he's in Suicide Squad. That. Yeah, it looks really great. So he's a great actor and he's willing to take chances. He's also been in a lot of films that took chances. There were original properties that failed at the box office. So he's at this point right now trying to get that big Willie Smith moment back and, you know, hey, I can open July 4th again or I can do that. You know, mm. he's not really a, the opening guy that he used to be. So with that being said, he can take a little more chances, take a few more roles that maybe aren't sequels or a big franchise thing, but stay in the game. That's what he's doing with Deadshot. Well, that's that's exactly right. As far as because the thing is with the with the DCU right now is that. Look at the superstardom that it's that the MCU has created. Mm -hmm. That we're we're in the baby stages of the DC universe right, yeah, too. Right. So he's one of those guys that once suicide. This you know the the viewer who wrote in is right that once this movie pops, it's going to do really well. Suicide Squad, and once it does, and I think he'll be one of the guys that stands out. He might have a, a resurgence as the big movie star. 
All right, what's next? Eric Mayer writes, what are your thoughts on this? Will the success of Star Wars 7's marketing campaign and trailer release change the way other studios do their marketing? If something works, history shows that other people will try to emulate that model. Could this usher in a new era in movie marketing and create a new age of event movies? Thanks and keep on living the dream. It's, you know, a lot of people have seen this incredible, unparalleled, never to be repeated, uh, phenomenon that has been this Star Wars Force Awakens Mart campaign, the advanced sales, all that kind of stuff, how they've made an event, even out of the trailers themselves, they made a massive, you know, international event out of it, playing on Monday Night Football and all this kind of stuff. So I've been getting a lot of tweets and questions, I'm sure you guys have too, about, hey, is this going, and this is what our, our, our viewer is asking right now, is this going to change the way other studios now market their films? I don't think it will, and there's a very important reason why not every other film is Star Wars. Like you have to take into consideration what is your property and what will work best for your property. Let me do something I never do, which is make a sports analogy. So <laughs> it's like you are the New England Patriots and you've got Tom Brady and Tom Brady just threw 60 passes, which is, for those of you who don't follow football, that's a lot of passes. Most, most football teams do not throw anywhere near that passes in a game. So he throws 60 passes and they win, you know, 40 to zero. So then you can ask, ah, now should, will every NFL team start throwing 50 passes per game? Not every team has Tom Brady at quarterback. So that so you have to do something different for your team. Not every movie carries the, the gravitas that Star Wars does, the generational belovement that Star Wars does. Star Wars can do this sort of marketing because it is Star Wars and they did what was best and most effective for them. Now, that being said, Anne Hathaway has Colossal coming out. You try to pull the same marketing techniques as Star Wars for this new movie, it's gonna bomb because that's not what that movie is. They have to find what works best for their movie. So while we can all stand in awe and wonder and amazement at these records that were smashed and all this kind of stuff, I really don't think you're going to see it change the way most Hollywood movies are marketed. Maybe Marvel takes a cue for like Avenger, for uh, you know Avengers: Infinity War Part One. Maybe you know DC takes a cue for Justice League Part One. But these are going to be very, very few films that can leverage this the way Star Wars has. Anyway, Christian, you saw this whole thing unfold. How much influence do you think that this Star Wars marketing campaign will have on the rest of Hollywood? Not much. Although I do think that the one place it might have a similar strategy like we were saying with Marvel is Disney. Disney might try to do things because they've worked. I don't think they're going to copycat what they've done because like you were saying, Star Wars is, is very, because even when Star Wars doesn't have a trailer, Star Wars still has a lot of marketing out there. Star Wars yeah. has toys. Star Wars has forced the, the force. Star Wars Friday. has us. I was going to, I was just going <laughs> to say, no, but it's true. Star Wars has shows like, you know, Jedi Council and it has shows like that are, that are just consistently talking about it. And it's the, the books, everything there's, it's, it's there, it's present. Bringing up Colossal again doesn't. It's a brand new property. It does You know, these these movies. It would not benefit from doing it that way. And even a movie like, I don't know if Ultron would have benefited from this particular strategy. I think Ultron did have that trailer that dropped five months in advance, and it and it got people talking about yeah. it. Star Wars just kind of does it on its own. And like like Star Trek, I don't think would work the same way. I could be wrong. Star Trek might work that way, but I, I don't. I, it, there's just something about Star Wars in the way that it, the, the mythology and what it did for pop culture, and it's just it's. Like, I think you mentioned it last week, Schnapp, as far as what it is and what it means to people in general. It's a different beast altogether. But I think there's strategies that that could be put together for Disney that might um, might do it. Schnapp. Yeah, I don't think it's repeatable, uh, mainly because. Uh, this new Star Wars has Han Solo and Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia characters that were like introduced to us like over 30 years ago. So it's it has this built in nostalgia that's inescapable. Like for me, hearing Han Solo and seeing that Millennium Falcon like hits me as like what hit me as a kid. Yeah. Right. And that's undeniable. And there's nothing else that can ever recreate that. We, we were sitting beside each other in a movie theater, AMC Century City 15. Last, last December, yeah. November. It, it, oh, sorry, was it November? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was right in, yeah. in November, so almost a full year ago. And I'm sitting beside Schnepp. And that first shot of that first teaser trailer, when we first see the Millennium Falcon, I remember looking over at you, and you weren't moving, you weren't jumping up and down. But I, I looked over at you, and I swear to God, he was this, like <laughs> the grin, the grin on your face when that Millennium Falcon, like it, it was, it was like that's 
Star Wars, right there. Yeah. It was amazing. I mean, it's an emotional thing. You can't reconnect. You can't. No one else has that power except that movie because that movie ma meant so much to everyone back then, even with stinky prequels. Yeah, that's right. I said it. Those stinky prequels. Um, <laughs> the movie was able to surpass that. And then, then we have millennials growing up watching those first three, then four, five, and six. So they actually, it finishes strong. They're like, yeah, the first three were kind of, eh, but it all made sense when I watched the other ones. So with this seventh one, it's like this kind of crazy freight train built in for all ages. Generations, yeah. Generations. So can that be done again? Hey, look, you have Civil War. Can they do that? Can they play that trailer in front of another, uh, you know, football game and make me have to watch a football game? <laughs> <laughs> Probably won't happen again, man. Because I'll be like, I'll just wait for for it to pop online. The Star Wars thing was something special. Not saying Civil War, the new trailer for that, when that pops online, that'll be something special too. It could make maybe half the people watch that football game, but it has to have that. It has to have that energy and that strength that Star Wars really is kind of the king of right right now. All right, well, folks, I said we would take a little bit of time and take some of your live Twitter questions. Once again, send in your tweets and make sure you're following us at Collider Video. Just that simple. You might want to kiss up to Ashley a little bit mm -hmm. because she's the one who chooses out the question. So we're going to get through as many tweets as we can right now. So, Ashley, what is in the tweet? Topes writes, what if movies were directed for Netflix instead of cinemas, more runtime and development? I don't think you'd really see all that much more runtime. I think, look, there's... There's a way to tell a good story. And it, like the, the art of filmmaking is being able to tell. And this is, I talk about this a lot. This is the big difference between television and, and movies, okay? Even movies made for television. With television, you have a little bit more of a luxury in the fact that you have a universe of time. You can tell your story whatever pace you want. You can bring in this important character in episode six if you want and all that kind of stuff. The art of filmmaking is on, this is just my opinion, is on another level. Because you got two hours, roughly, give or take a little bit, and you got roughly two hours to do it all, to introduce your story, introduce all your characters, get you emotionally attached to them, introduce what the, what the plot, uh, the conflict is going to be, how they overcome the conflict and come to a resolution of the story. You got two hours to do it. And I think even with films being directed for Netflix, I think directors, at least the good ones, are still bringing that mentality, the storyteller's mentality into it. So I honestly don't think you're going to see it change it all that much. I'm sure there'll be some procedural differences, mm. absolutely. Yeah, for sure. But I think the heart of the storyteller, like I know like Schnepp has the heart of a storyteller and I think he's going to tell his story regardless if it's going to be on a big screen here or a small screen there. I don't know, Schnepp, how do you see it? Yeah, as far as a feature, I mean, especially with a documentary, I just finished a doc. It's you have to keep it at a certain length because it's just it's just so much coming at the viewer that it becomes draining. If you have an act one, act two, act three story structure, which is different, you can do. I think you can make it like two and a half hours if it's told really well. Like we just saw Jobs, the Steve Jobs right. movie. Now, to me, I thought it was a really good film. The acting was incredible. The script was great. The directing was fantastic. But I wanted more. There was something about it where I just I just wanted maybe one. I mean, and that's just me, but I just wanted a few more scenes of flashbacks, a little a little bit more that established why Jobs was the way he was with his family or with with uh, Wozniak and all these other characters. I really like the film, but if it was made for Netflix and he, they could have just expanded it even another 30 minutes. I think it might have serviced the story a lot better. So you might see those kind of changes with Netflix, with movies. Maybe they'll do the three-hour epic or break it into three episodes or make two mini-movies as opposed to one big movie. So, I mean, those are the changes I see. I agree with you, Schnepp, too. I think that like, eventually this is the, where we're going to go. I mean, even look at like Adam Sandler, who's got a deal now making movies for Netflix. I think more and more people will be doing movies for Netflix eventually. Like, look, If someone like Scorsese ever did a movie for Netflix, a lot of times his cuts are three hours, three hours mm -hmm. and 20 minutes, and he, he has to cut it down for theatrical runs and everything. Right. He won't have to do that. Now, there are some times that I think, it, like you guys are saying, it should fit the the mold because their attention spans for viewers like you go to a Scorsese movie and you even click and you know you're probably gonna get a longer yeah, movie and yeah. you'll because that's just his style well, and Peter you're, right. Jackson or something right like that. and you're and you're ready for it if it becomes a thing like the, the, now I still think that sometimes you walk into a movie and everyone's going how, how long is this two twenty two thirty why is it that long you hear that all the time two forty why is well, it that our, long our own Ray. Our, our graphics guy, like the first question, whenever we ask, hey, you want to go to the movie? The first question you ask, how long, how is, long it? is it? Yeah. If it's <laughs> over like two hours and one minute, nah, man, nah, just <laughs> nah. I can't, I can't do a movie that but long. It, but there is, and it's, it's, I think that it will happen, but also it, 
it, there's a sense you, it doesn't want to be too dangerous. You, you have a chance to be dangerous by people going, oh, no time limit. Just do whatever you want right. to do because studios hold people to time limits also. And it's great to see Shoes Beef the Bird back. <laughs> Wait, I thought he was called Clocky. Uh, clocky, the Clocky, the Collider Twitter Bird. Somebody sent me a tweet. Somebody sent a message and says, "Send Clocky the Twitter Bird back to Marvel." Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's go through a few more. All right. ASAP Josh writes, "What is the scariest movie that you only watched one time because it's so frightening?" Mine is The Conjuring. No, I've I've never had one that I enjoyed so much because it was so scary that I would go back and watch it again. American Werewolf in London, The Descent. Um films those are the the two my two favorite horror films. If a horror film can really, really scare you, that means it's great, and I'm gonna watch it again. So uh, I, I don't have any that I thought was a great horror movie and mm. never watched it again. Do you guys? I, I have one, but I'll say, I like what you said. It's movies that scare me, I love, and I'll see again and, and again rare. and again. And they're rare. I mean, it started for me like way back in Nightmare on Elm Street. That scared me, the idea that a guy can get into your brain and, and kill you in your sleep, it was freaky. The Descent, just those ladies like crawling through the tunnels. Uh, that's scary enough. I don't even need a monster. It's like, you're insane. Why are you crawling through these like tiny tunnels? That movie terrified. You're yeah. right. Long before the yeah. monster showed before up. Before the I was creature terrified. showed up, those girls are like, I'm like, <laughs> insanity. So, but I'll say this uh, one movie that really freaked me out like three, maybe four years ago, it's called Martyrs. Now, you have to be over 18 to see this film. And it's not that it's necessarily like scary, it's just mentally brutal and it's horrifying. So I've only seen it once and I was like, never see it again. I felt like I got what it was trying to say and it was really messed up. So that's the one I would say. Um, the Strangers was one for me, that it's, and it's a really, oh, really? good movie. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's, it's, it was, it was a, I, I love the movie, it's a really good movie, but it's, it, I remember seeing, it was the one movie I saw, I remember seeing it in the theater and I saw also Century City. And it was the one movie I just sat there in the credits like, well, uh, I, I, and like the credits are going. Normally, right. I get up and, I, and I'll go. I'm just sat there going because it's such a bummer it's ending. It's such a bummer ending, yeah, and it's yeah. so real yeah. that you're just like. I remember. I don't know if I need to see it again. No, I agree with you. On it's that one. super, super creepy. And the other one, which I don't know, is actually a horror movie, and I always forget that Monica Bellucci. Uh, Un oh, I know. Irreversible. Irreversible. Yeah, that's no, a that's movie to me. Another that it, crushing it's, film. It's, it's a horror movie in in a way because it's so. It's, it's a hard movie. It's a to tough watch. movie to watch, <laughs> and it's so graphic, and it is it is also terrifying in general for many people. I saw it once. I remember saying powerful, but no thanks. Let me get another one in there. Requiem for a dream. That's yeah. like a, if you're like feeling really bummed out about your life, see that movie. You'll, you'll feel, feel better. better. You'll yeah. feel way better about your life and really. Busted up about those people's lives, like the two old ladies crying on the bench at the end. Tell me you don't have tears in your eyes, Jared Leto. And, 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 oh, my love. <laughs> and then, a little bit of trivia about *Wrecking for a Dream*: the score, that that one piece from *Wrecking for a Dream*, yeah. has been used in what 730 trailers? <laughs> wow. So many. So, like it's always in that. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Uh, Ashley, I'm just curious. Have you ever seen a movie? Well, what's yeah, the scariest movie? Yeah, I was going to ask you guys. I have this thing. Okay. Uh, the Exorcism of Emily Rose, oh, I think yeah. it's called. Very well done. All possession movies, they freak me out. I, I feel like when I watch them, I'm going to get possessed. Like God's uh, like, oh, uh, why uh. are you watching that? You're going to get possessed now. And then I get scared. <laughs> like, I'm going to get possessed. I, now I feel like I'm going to get possessed even talking about it. I think <laughs> so you are going to get You look possessed. like you're getting agitated you, right yeah. now. Guys, I, I burped in the conference room. She's like, oh my God, I sound like an exorcist. No, do it, do it. I'm not doing it now. Do it yeah. now. <laughs> I got to do it. Say I can do no, it. No, come on. Ashley. You'll find out. Like that. Ashley okay. wants guys to perform on demand. I'm not going to go do. anywhere beyond that. So anyway. <laughs> okay, what else we got? Let's do some rapid fire. I'm Louis sorry. writes, what is the best spinoff movie? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Uh, best spinoff movie? I, mm, it's hard to think of some spinoff yeah, movies. Sure. Certainly not. So this is 40. Um, no, this would is 40 the Avengers minutes too long. be a spinoff of the other four yeah. films? I mean, it's more like a culmination yeah, than like, a yeah, spinoff. Kind of Creed, I haven't seen it yet. Creed looks awesome. Yeah. That could be a great. Well, they had uh, the Jim Carrey God movie, and then yeah. Steve Carell was in it. That yeah, was pretty no, bad. Not so yeah. good. I have to think about that. I mean, yeah. I can think of some better. I can think of some good spinoff TV shows off the top of my head, but spinoff movies. That's good. All right, what's next? Max Decker writes, "Hey guys, love the show. I was wondering, so far in 2015, which movie have you seen the most in theater?" Okay, this is one of those crappy things where I'm going to have to open up the list of movies yeah. of opened because I was for Kingsman. I, I could tell you right now, oh, it was Kingsman. Mad Max: Fury Road. How many times did you see it? Three times. Okay, yeah, I saw Kingsman t two and a half times. You saw King uh, Kingsman? I think I saw four times. Mm. Let me just bring up. Did you see Ant Man? 
Oh yeah, Ant Man. Yeah. I saw Ant Man seven times. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So Ant Man, Ant Man is the one that I saw the most this year. Okay. What's next? Chelsea Neal writes, hello, was wondering if you've heard any whispers about the Magic the Gathering movie that's in the works. No, other than the fact that it that it happened, I had a white blue deck. Um, other than I heard that at one point it was happening, I really haven't heard anything else since. So I, no more updates for me. I don't know if it's shelved or it's still in development. Ellis would know. He's obsessed. Oh, is he? Oh, is he a Magic oh, the Gathering freak? freak Michigan, yeah, hit that and Tetris. And yeah. buying my cards online. Oh, yeah. He'll know. <laughs> Ask him. All right. All right, what's next? What do you think of an adaptation of Grand Theft Auto? Well, I mean, actually, actually, here's the thing about Grand Theft Auto. You could make a movie and call it Grand Theft Auto and make it about anything you right. want it to be. Yeah. That's actually kind of, it's kind of like Warcraft that way. You can make Warcraft and you can use some of the characters, but you can actually make up any story you want and put it in there and still call Warcraft. I think with Grand Theft Auto, you can make a really violent, gritty kind of street uh, yeah. movie, like crime or whatever. You can put that in there and call it Grand Theft Auto and just take advantage of the uh, of the uh, uh, brand name. I yeah. I would be for it. I think it would be a smart move. If they do it, I'd want it to be something like The Raid, uh, you meet yeah. Scarface, you know, it, meets Fast and the Furious. And it would have to be ultra violent, yeah. like beyond cathartic violence. Like there'd have to be like at least five scenes where people are like just in a car running over people in the streets for no reason for no whatsoever. reason uh, it would just have to be that kind of high end wouldn't be controversial violence. at all uh, you know, the, yeah, Grand Theft can be many, many different films. Schnepp was over at my place once, and he started playing Grand Theft Auto. I'm like, what kind of evil are you? And he's like, I, uh, he's like, <laughs> That's right. his, uh, yeah, just straight. like so much fun to murder. I don't know. <laughs> okay, what's next? Sorry, that last question came from Michael Sanders. I forgot to mention that. We don't care. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm we kidding. love you, Michael. We love All right. you, Michael. Um, Jeremy Gold writes, what was your guys' thoughts on me, Earl, and the Dying Girl? Oh, I really liked it. It's 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 one of those films that's tough to market. It's it's just it just the is title so, alone. the title yeah. alone is they probably should have given it a different title because that wasn't going to that was actually probably going to alienate some people or, or intimidate some people. Good movie deserved a better reception. Uh, no, it got a good reception, but just that nobody was at the reception. It deserved a better uh, result than it got. Uh, it's it's a nice little film, and it. it they should have marketed it a little bit better, changed the title, things like that. I don't know. What do you guys think? I really enjoyed the movie a lot. And what I thought, it was very, I really liked 50-50 when that movie came out as mm -hmm. well, too. And what I liked about it is with, with the topic of cancer and, and you know, people dying is if they, if it's just the sadness is overall sad, it's hard for the viewer to watch the whole thing. But when they mix it with real people who are dealing with it and it's, and there's some light and there's some humor with it, combined with the seriousness of it, it, it makes for a good film. And I thought <laughs> that's what me, Earl and the Dying Girl did really well. Yeah, I missed it. I'm going to check it out. It's on video now, so I'm going to check it out. All right, what's next? Lucas One Month writes, how excited are you guys for Mockingjay Part 2, and how well do you think it will perform at the box office? I'm more excited for it than you might think, actually. I have been a big fan of, of the series. I'm actually not that big fan of the books. Um, I thought the second two books were okay. I, I, maybe at best, but I've really enjoyed the films up to this point. Now, my one criticism of the last one that we saw was it felt like all set up. Even though I still love the movie, my fear is is that they're gonna do what the final two Hobbit films did, which was like the second last one was just all set up, and the third one was just all payoff. But when you're just all payoff, it loses the emotional hook. Because it's been a year since we saw the mm. setup to this, you know, sort of thing. So I'm a little bit worried about that, but overall I've really enjoyed this franchise, and I'm very much, now how much will it make opening weekend? I think it's going to drop a bit. I think opening weekend maybe ninety. I think I'm, I could be off by one hundred and fifty million. I don't know, but I'm, I'm going to guess ninety. <laughs> I th well, opening weekend I think it'll do about one thirty. Um, I think it's going to do pretty well. Um, but I also I agree, and I also think that you should be hesitant about that happening. And I think it's going to happen. I think mm -hmm. that you're going to have a lot of action because it's it's a shorter book than the other two, and they split it into two pages because they're following that trend. But I actually really liked Mockingjay <laughs> Part One and thought that it was all set up. But it's going to lead, when you watch Mockingjay 1 and 2 together, it's going to serve as a better experience. I just believe that because, and I don't know how what they're going to do with the story, if they're going to change it up. Normally they change up endings for certain books. I'm curious if they're going to do that for this one. But with this movie, I think when you watch it as a whole, even though it'll wind up being like a five-hour movie when you watch it, I think it's like the way Kill Bill did. Right. I think that that's what's going to serve you better. Although I do think that this is going to be a lot of action. We are going to get a payoff. So I am very excited about it, actually. It's one of the movies. There's only the handful left maybe that I, that I really am dying to see, and that's absolutely one of them. Yeah, I'm medium excited. I'm not like dying to see it, but when it comes out, I'll see it that first week. I think they're going to change the, the, sec, you know, the second act 
of the second part of the movie to, to make an actual feature film out of it so it doesn't feel like, so. like the Hobbit, yeah, Lord, yeah. Lord of the Five Armies thing where it was just like one continuous ending. Uh, I'm sure they, they changed it up so they, they, both films will stand alone as feature films and then when you watch them together it'll be a cohesive part one, part two. All right, let's do three or four more just rapid yeah. style here. Um, Shah Shahid writes, hey, I'm a huge fan of the show. My question is, do you think Batman and Superman will become friends at the end of the film? Oh, no doubt. Yes. Absolutely no doubt. They're going to battle it out. But then remember, they're calling it Dawn of Justice. They're going to lay the groundwork for Justice League, and you can't lay the groundwork if they're still fighting each right. other. Right, I so. think they'll fight each other. Superman will blow Batman's head off, and then the end, and there's nothing else left. That's the end of the franchise. <laughs> no, DC that'll be wins. Comes yeah, right the there. DC yeah. wins. No, they'll be friends. Yeah. All right, what's next? Chris Jurdis writes, what are some films that you may have watched when you were younger and have understood better as a more developed adult? Uh, Jaws, because as a kid watching Jaws, as a little kid watching Jaws, it's like, oh, scary monster. Mm -hmm. But then when you watch Jaws now, it's like, this is a brilliant film. Yeah, Chinatown. characters, depth, Chinatown. Chinatown, I was going to say Chinatown. Um, I have to think about it still, but it was going to go Chinatown. Jaws is a good one, though. Yeah, I mean, that, you yeah, see, I you see more it. things than that the older you get. I want to revisit, uh, sorry, uh, Close Encounters, because I haven't seen Close Encounters. Oh, that's Encounters. another one, yeah. I haven't seen it in so long, and I remember I saw it when I was a lot younger, and I, yeah, I like this, but then everyone raves about it all the time, how great it is. I've got to go and rewatch that It's movie. so worth rewatching, yeah. mainly because of Richard Dreyfuss. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so literally good. like the, his storyline. <laughs> I mean, he, he, but like that was his movie, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's Close Encounters, you remember it for all these effects and the little creatures and you know, with the do 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 do, but yeah. honestly, when you watch it as an adult, you're like, wow, it's a really fun film to see this him kind of go through this whole thing to get there. All right, what's next? Jack Cole writes, "What intellectual property, game, book, etc., would you like to see be made into a movie that hasn't been made yet?" Huh. Black that, Star. That hasn't been made yet. Which one's Black no, Star? It wasn't a game. It was a it was a property, but it was a it, it was it was pretty much what they based He Man off of. Oh sure, it, it was, was like, a, but they were cowboys. Yeah. No, no, no. Black Star was was he was I forget if he was like an astronaut or what he was, but he had, it was it was again it was like this mighty sword. Look up Black Star, by the way. It's a but they had cowboy jump. hats. Not 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 that. You I just imagine Silverhawks. Maybe you're oh, thinking. Oh, maybe of? I'm thinking of something. Um, but Black Star is one that I think could be interesting, and I think it's I think it's Mattel. I'm still waiting for Splinter Cell. Let's get on it, man. I'm waiting for that. GoBots. Oh, go by. No, I'm not. No one. Well, okay, what's one. next? <laughs> ben Thompson writes, I saw an article that there's a Wicked movie coming. Just wondering if it's true. Thanks. Yeah, I heard that as well. And it, it, uh, I don't know what what uh, stage you're at in the development. I also heard they're going to turn Makes sense. It, it was a big phenomenon as a stage play. It's a good story to tell. The the uh, whole notion of the Wizard of Oz world is fair game. As long as you don't copy other people's material while you're doing it, it's fair game. So I think it's going to come, I, but I have no idea. It's not Mila Kunis playing. With not Mila okay. Kunis right. playing. Okay, okay. 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 No. okay, two more quick ones. All right. Jeremy Gold writes, are you guys disappointed we never saw a School of Rock 2? Nope. 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 <sighs> no, if it would have happened, I would have liked it to happen a little earlier. I would have gone to see it if I it came out. Yeah. But if it came out like a year yeah. later, School of Rock 2, I would have yeah. seen it. But now like, it's just weird because all those kids are probably yeah. you know, And also, drunk. It's why, a, why a second <laughs> one? It was like perfect for one movie. Yeah. All right, last one of the day. Kai writes, hi, Collider crew. Keep up the good work. Like John C. said, I, too, love Best of the Best. Do you think yes. a remake will ever get made? I, I do, Look, you you could, but the, look, look, hey, here's the thing about Best of the Best, which is, like, so awesome. But <laughs> when you break it down to its components, it's totally awful. They somehow found a way with the right mixture of cheese and awkwardness and weirdness, whether it's, you know, Ro Eric Roberts or whether it's James Earl Jones, whatever, that somehow took this awful recipe and made something delightfully delicious. I don't know that you can do that again. I mean, I'm fine with it if you want to remake it. Go ahead. If it sucks, I still have the original. That's great. But it's the building blocks aren't there to make a great movie. They somehow fluked into making an awesome movie with best of the best that I don't know that you could be lucky enough to redo. So what if I, you did it with MMA? Again, I don't know that you yeah, could fluke into making that good. Yeah. I mean, MMA would be the way to do it now. You'd, you'd have to have like, you know, uh, America versus uh, England or America versus Canada or America versus Russia. You know, Russia or something like that. What was that kid who like would do the, the like the horse, but the ninjata? Nin, nin, uh, nin, nin, what's it? Jim, nin, ninjitsu nin, or nin, what was it? No, ninjitsu is the actual thing. Uh, nin, ninjkata? No, something like that. Yes. Yeah. Where he was an Olympic yeah. uh, thing like, and he mixed that right. with martial arts. Jim Kata? Jim Kata. Jim Kata is what Perfect. it was called. But that's probably my next door neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing out at our friends over at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and your movie ticket information. Love entertainment news? Make sure you bookmark Collider.com. Steve Frosty, Ryan Traub, and his crack team of writers over there is always doing a great job keeping you up to date with everything going on, putting everything into a little bit of context for you. Make sure, again, you bookmark Collider.com. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. John Schnepp, the man with the heart of a storyteller. I can't believe I said it like that. That was cheesy. Mr. John Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp and at T-D-O-S-L-W-H. You can find uh, today, later, live, we're going to do another uh, Heroes. Collider Heroes will be on like in about an hour, two hours. <laughs> Check it out. And uh, you'll see all of us at San Lee's Kamikaze this weekend. We've got a Schmoes No panel at like 1 o'clock. Yeah. And then following that, well, at 3 o'clock will be a Collider Movie Talk panel. So bring your sweaty questions and freak out with us. I'll also be screening The Death of Superman Lives. What happened? Me and Holly will have a booth there at booth 329. So come on down at San Lee's Kamikaze. That's we'll be here that, that this weekend. I can't even talk. Bye. Sitting over here on my right, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? Well, like Schnepp said, on Sunday at Kamikaze, make sure you check us out. We'll be there for the Collider and the Schmoes panels. And a lot of stuff happening this week for in the world of Star Wars with myself and John. We're doing our Rebels after show. If you guys have not checked out already, uh, check that out already, please do. We're three episodes into season two here, so make sure you check that. That'll be up tomorrow. And then on Thursday for Collider Jedi Council, working on a very special guest. I can't confirm it yet, but it looks like we might have a very special guest. Stay tuned Not there. to get your hopes up, like it's not Mark Hamill or anything <laughs> no, like no, 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 no. But, I'm just, <laughs> but we are very special, excited about who this might be. If you're a Star yes. Wars fan, then you'll be, you'll be pretty, pretty happy you'll be if, we can, get it, it. if yeah. we can get it. Um, and also make sure that you hashtag Collider Jedi Council to get your questions on the air. And of course, our lovely host today, the currently not possessed Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you online? Or am I? Ooh. Oh. Twitter, Instagram, at Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. That was scary. Oh, <laughs> and Mova. you guys can follow me on the social medias. Just follow me on Twitter or on Facebook, simply at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. My name's John Campia, and until next time. Bye bye. Shoes beef. Hey Swallow guys, yourself. If you like this Swallow video, yourself. click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.